Hi, my name is Aisha Mustafa, and I'm a third-year medical student at the University of Saskatchewan. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. A special thanks to Dr. McCarville, vascular surgeon and clinical assistant professor, for his expertise on this subject. This episode will review the pathophysiology of PAD, clinical features, investigations, medical and surgical management, and then we'll go over a few clinical cases. Peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, is the narrowing or blockage of peripheral arteries resulting in reduced blood flow. Atherosclerosis is the most common cause, but rarely it can be caused by Burgers disease, vasculitis, and cystic adventitial disease. The arteries of the lower limb are most commonly affected. A quick review of the arterial anatomy of the lower limb. The abdominal aorta bifurcates at the level of L4 to become the left and right common iliac arteries. These divide into the internal iliacs, which supply the pelvis and gluteal region, and the external iliacs that pass under the inguinal ligament, becoming the common femoral arteries. The common femorals divide into the profunda femoris and superficial femoral arteries. The profunda femoris is an important source of collateral circulation for the lower limb. After the superficial femoral passes through the adductor hiatus, it becomes the popliteal artery and gives off the anterior tibial artery that becomes the dorsalis pedis in the foot. The popliteal artery becomes the tibioperineal trunk, which divides into the posterior tibial and perineal arteries. The posterior tibial can be palpated behind the medial malleolus. Common patterns of PAD in the lower limb are categorized as aortoiliac, femoropopliteal, and infrapopliteal, but multi-level disease is common. Diabetic patients often develop infrapopliteal disease. Clinical presentation. PAD is a spectrum of disease ranging from asymptomatic to severe limb ischemia. Patients with PAD may be asymptomatic despite significant disease because this occurs gradually, allowing time for nearby arteries to dilate and accommodate more flow, and collateral circulation to develop, providing blood supply through alternative routes. Patients with PAD can present with claudication or rest pain and tissue loss, which is considered critical limb ischemia. Claudication is muscular pain with exercise that is relieved with rest. During exertion, the supply-demand mismatch causes temporary ischemia and pain, usually in the muscle group below the level of disease. So the location of claudication and a thorough pulse assessment points towards which arteries are diseased. Since the superficial femoral and popliteal arteries are most commonly affected, claudication is often localized to the calf. Foot claudication often means infrapopliteal disease, and thigh claudication indicates common femoral disease. Aortoiliac disease can cause a triad of hip and buttock claudication, erectile dysfunction, and absent femoral pulses, called Lariche syndrome. Other conditions may mimic claudication. Think of spinal stenosis if the pain is brought on with weight bearing or standing, and better when bending over or lying down. Suspect arthritis in patients with joint pain, worse in the morning, often better with activity, and not promptly relieved with rest. During your history, assess the severity of claudication by getting an idea of their claudication distance and whether this is stable or not, and if not, how quickly it is progressing. Ask about rest pain and tissue loss. Some patients with rest pain and tissue loss will have a prior history of claudication, but this can also be their initial presentation. Rest pain is a severe burning pain in the forefoot or toes, worse at night when laying in bed because the legs are elevated, but also possibly due to the decrease in blood pressure at night. Classically, rest pain is relieved by standing or dangling the foot off the bed, allowing gravity to assist in providing blood flow. Patients with rest pain often have elevation pallor and dependent rupture, which is when the limb goes pale when lifted and becomes dusky red when returned to a dependent position. Diabetic neuropathy can be mistaken for ischemic rest pain, as it is also a burning or shooting sensation in the foot that is worse at night when there is less distraction. Certain features can help distinguish diabetic neuropathy from ischemic rest pain, such as it is not relieved by dependency of the foot, it's often symmetrically distributed in both legs, and associated with decreased reflexes and vibratory sensation. Neuropathy and vascular disease can also coexist. Tissue loss is non-healing wounds, ulcers, or gangrene that occur when blood flow is inadequate to maintain tissue viability. Arterial ulcers usually form at the end of arterial branch points, such as the toes and at sites of pressure points, like the metatarsal heads and lateral malleolus. Arterial ulcers are very painful, well demarcated with a punched out appearance, and associated with other features of PAD, like weak pulses, dry shiny pale or cool skin, and heaping toenails. Gangrene is necrotic tissue that appears black and can be classified as wet or dry. Dry gangrene is more common in PAD, develops more slowly, and has a dry, dehydrated appearance. 
wet gangrene is gangrene that is infected. If gangrene looks moist, is foul smelling and blistering, suspect wet gangrene, which is a surgical emergency and requires urgent debridement and IV antibiotics. The ankle brachial index, or ABI, is a quick screening test for PAD. The ABI for each lower extremity is calculated by dividing the higher ankle pressure, either the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial in each leg, with the higher brachial pressure between both arms. When measuring the ABI, a handheld Doppler is often used rather than a stethoscope to measure the systolic pressures. In the Surgery 101 podcast on March 29, 2017, titled Examination of the Peripheral Pulses, Dr. Cox shows how to measure the ABI and use the handheld Doppler. Normally, the pressures in the foot should be equal to those in the arm, giving an ABI close to 1. An ABI below 0.9 indicates PAD, and patients often have claudication. An ABI below 0.5 indicates severe disease, and patients often have rest pain or tissue loss. In patients with suspected PAD with a normal or borderline ABI, a post-exercise ABI can unmask underlying disease. If the ABI is 1.3 or higher, it's likely that the ankle arteries are calcified and non-compressible. A toe brachial index can be done since calcification often spares the digital arteries. A normal toe brachial index is greater than 0.6. Other non-invasive tests can be done in the vascular lab. A segmental pressure study is like measuring the ABI, but thigh and calf pressures are also measured to observe pressure differences between adjacent cups. A drop greater than 20 between two levels indicates a hemodynamically significant lesion in that segment. Pulse volume recordings are another test where sensors in the blood pressure cuffs record the pattern and shape of waveforms produced by arterial blood flow at each level, which are then analyzed to assess blood flow to the lower limbs. Management. Risk factor modification and medical therapy are important for all patients with PAD. This includes smoking cessation, regular exercise, blood pressure and diabetes control, statin therapy, and antiplatelet agents such as aspirin or clopidogrel. Revascularization is indicated for patients with severe lifestyle limiting claudication and critical limb ischemia. Case 1. Imagine you're seeing Mr. Clausen, a 60-year-old male, refer to vascular surgery for a one-year history of right calf pain. After around one block, he has to slow down or stop walking because his right calf cramps up. This happens sooner if walking uphill and if trying to keep up with his grandkids. He denies any rest pain or non-healing wounds. He does not have hypertension, dyslipidemia, or diabetes, but he does have a 40-pack year smoking history. He denies any prior history of MI or stroke. On exam, you assess all his pulses and listen for breweries. Both legs are warm to the touch and he has no ulcers. All pulses are palpable except for the right popliteal. You grab the handheld Doppler and place the probe over the popliteal artery. Does this sound indicate good blood flow? Well, not necessarily. A Doppler signal can be weak or strong and described as triphasic, biphasic, or monophasic. Triphasic flow has three phases corresponding to three sounds. The first sound is from systolic forward flow. The second sound is from a brief reversal of flow during early diastole. And the third sound is late diastolic forward flow. Triphasic flow is normal and sounds like In biphasic flow, there is a loss of either of the diastolic phases. Biphasic flow can be normal or indicate calcification or mild to moderate disease. Biphasic flow sounds like Monophasic flow is only one phase and is always abnormal. It sounds like... Let's play these sounds again. Triphasic. Biphasic. And monophasic. Back to our case. When you placed the Doppler probe over his right popliteal artery, you heard Is this normal or abnormal? This sounds like monophasic flow, which is abnormal and often indicates severe disease. You measure his right ABI to be 0.6. Is this what you would expect in a patient with claudication? Yes, claudication range is 0.5 to 0.9. What is your management plan for our patient with claudication? He is advised to quit smoking and exercise regularly to build up collateral blood flow and increase his claudication distance. If he had hypertension, ACE inhibitors are recommended, not only for their antihypertensive effects, but also because they are potent vasodilators and antiatherogenic. You start him on rosuvastatin and aspirin 81 milligrams daily.
You also prescribe silostazole, 100 milligrams BID. You warn him that he may experience headaches and diarrhea, which are common side effects. Silostazole can be trialed in patients without heart failure to help symptoms of claudication. Silostazole is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that vasodilates and reduces platelet aggregation. What is the risk of his claudication symptoms getting worse or needing an amputation? Research shows that over the next five years, claudication remains stable in 70 to 80 percent of patients, 10 to 20 percent have worsening claudication, and 1 to 3 percent will progress to critical limb ischemia. There is a low risk of limb loss, around 1 to 3 percent. Back to our case. Mr. Clausen is seen in follow-up a year later. Unfortunately, he hasn't quit smoking and his claudication distance has significantly decreased. He's worried he's going to lose his job as a construction worker. He also notes discomfort and numbness in the affected foot when lying in bed. The pain is somewhat relieved by dangling his feet off the edge of the bed and walking around his bedroom. His ABI today is 0.4. How do you interpret his ABI? His ABI of 0.4 confirms severe ischemia and is consistent with his history of rest pain. What is the risk of amputation with critical limb ischemia? Within one year, 30% will undergo amputation, 25% will die from cardiovascular causes, and less than half will be alive with both limbs. Rest pain and tissue loss are limb-threatening and treated with revascularization to relieve pain, heal wounds, and prevent a major amputation. When choosing between open versus endovascular approaches to revascularization, vascular surgeons consider multiple factors including the pattern and extent of disease, the patient's anesthetic risk, the severity of comorbid conditions, the durability of the intervention, whether or not the patient had any previous failed interventions, and other anatomic factors. A hybrid approach combining both open and endovascular techniques is increasingly common. The Transatlantic Intersociety Consensus, or TAS group, has put forth recommendations on which modality is best depending on the anatomic distribution of lesions. In general, angioplasty and stenting is a less invasive procedure that is better for shorter or focal lesions, better for stenosis rather than occlusion, and large diameter vessels. Bypass grafts are preferred in patients with longer segments of stenosis or occlusion, or with diffuse widespread disease. Bypass grafts have better long-term patency than angioplasty and stenting, but are quite extensive procedures that are avoided in frail patients with multiple comorbidities. Just a brief overview of other classification systems that provide a more comprehensive framework for evaluating the patient with critical limb ischemia. The Global Anatomic Staging System, or GLASS, looks at the distribution and severity of different lesions along the whole limb and grades them against the chances of success with endovascular treatment. The Wi-Fi classification grades the severity of three factors, wounds, foot infection, and ischemia, to gauge the severity of limb threat and risk of amputation, which we will discuss in our last case. Prior to revascularization, imaging is needed to assess the exact anatomic location and extent of disease. Both CT angiogram and conventional angiography require contrast, but they provide a detailed map of the arteries that can be used to plan surgical interventions. Conventional angiography is considered the gold standard. It is better at assessing the infrapopliteal vessels and also allows for endovascular interventions like angioplasty and stenting. Duplex ultrasound avoids the need for contrast and radiation, but is limited by body habitus and bowel gas. It is often ordered for follow-up after surgical revascularization. Mr. Clausen is sent for an urgent angiogram, which shows severe focal stenosis of the right popliteal artery above the knee and the popliteal tibial junction. Because he only has two short segments of disease, he undergoes angioplasty and stenting with good results. Potential complications of endovascular approaches are axocyte injuries, arterial dissection or rupture, stent fracture, distal embolization, and restenosis over time. Now consider another scenario where the angiogram showed more extensive disease, such as complete occlusion of the superficial femoral. A femoral popliteal bypass could be done. Now consider a third scenario if his angiogram showed only a focal occlusion of the common femoral. Femoral endarterectomy would be another option. Femoral endarterectomy for common femoral disease may have better long-term results than stenting, while avoiding a more extensive procedure like a bypass graft. The common femoral is also quite superficial in the groin and easily accessible. Endarterectomy involves making a longitudinal incision in the artery through which a plaque is separated and removed. The arteriotomy is ideally closed with a vein patch, but if the patient has no suitable veins to use, a bovine or synthetic patch can be used. This is called a patch angioplasty. The patch widens the artery lumen and reduces the risk of restenosis from intimal hyperplasia. Case 2. 
The vascular surgeon you are working with receives a consult from the ED to see a 60-year-old female with hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a 40-pack year smoking history. She presents with acute onset of right leg numbness and pallor. She also notes long-standing burning and cramping in both hips and upper thighs after walking less than 25 feet. She can barely walk up two to three stairs without feeling extremely weak. She has no palpable pulses in her lower extremities. With the handheld Doppler, there is a weak monophasic signal in her femoral and pedal arteries. The tips of several toes are black, and there is a small, well-demarcated, painful ulcer on her inner foot that started as a small blister months ago after breaking in new shoes. Her angiogram shows diffuse lower extremity disease with her right iliac segment completely occluded. Why does she have gangrene of her toes? Atherosclerotic disease involving the aortoiliac segment can result in microembolization, resulting in digital gangrene of the toes. Given her bilateral iliac disease, she undergoes aortobifemoral bypass. She is scheduled for suture removal and a wound check in two to three weeks after discharge. Despite having distal disease, her symptoms have resolved and her ulcer and surgical wounds are healing nicely. So no further intervention is needed at this point in time. She is booked for a follow-up ultrasound in a few months. Case three. A 73-year-old male with diabetes presents to the ED with progressive right leg pain over the last week and gangrenous changes to his right foot. Only today was his wife able to convince him to seek medical attention. His sensation is decreased, but he has chronic diabetic neuropathy. Motor strength in the affected leg is significantly diminished. His calf is not tense, but is very tender to the touch. He is taken emergently to the operating room. What is the significance of the calf tenderness? This is concerning for ischemic rhabdomyolysis, especially because the leg sounds like it's been severely ischemic for at least a week. If the calf had been tense, this would indicate compartment syndrome, which is a potential complication of severe rhabdomyolysis. This gentleman receives a FEMPOP bypass, and due to the risk of compartment syndrome, fasciotomies are also performed. Despite this, his foot and calf become progressively necrotic. A couple weeks later, he undergoes above-knee amputation. Amputation. Patients at increased risk of amputation are those with diabetes, renal failure, heart failure, those who smoke, and those with infections such as cellulitis or osteomyelitis. Indications for amputation include patients with critical limb ischemia with failed revascularization, extensive fetal gangrene, overwhelming pedal sepsis, non-reconstructable arterial anatomy, and patients with excessive surgical risk. After six weeks, patients can be fit for a prosthesis if all wounds have completely healed. In summary, peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, is often the manifestation of atherosclerosis and usually affects the lower limbs. Patients with PAD can be asymptomatic or present with claudication, breast pain, and tissue loss. An ankle brachial index below 0.9 indicates PAD, and less than 0.5 is consistent with severe disease, and patients often have breast pain or tissue loss. Risk factor modification and medical therapy are important for all patients with PAD to slow progression of disease and reduce symptoms. Revascularization with angioplasty and stenting and or bypass grafts are indicated in patients with critical limb ischemia due to their high risk of limb loss. Although a thorough pulse assessment and the location of symptoms can point towards which arteries are diseased, a CT angiogram or angiography is needed to identify the extent and specific location of disease. In general, the choice between endovascular or open surgery depends on how fit the patient is for surgery, the extent of disease, among other factors. Hybrid approaches combining angioplasty and stenting with bypass grafts are increasingly common. Duplex ultrasound is useful for follow-up after revascularization. Thanks for listening.